Hey everyone, I'm here at home. I'm about to make uh, one of my favorite breakfasts. It's a Turkish dish called menemen. Um, very easy. So it's basically, it's sort of like if, you, um, if you're if you familiar with shakshuka, which is a um, Middle Eastern uh, Israeli dish um, of eggs cooked in a spicy tomato sauce. Um, this is very similar. Um, so it's peppers, tomatoes, and eggs, and those are the basics of it. Some people will um, insist that onions are a part of the dish, an essential part of the dish. Other people will um, insist that onions don't belong in the dish at all. Um, today I'm gonna make it without onions. I just got half of an Anaheim pepper here. You can use a Hungarian wax pepper if you don't want any heat at all. You can, um, I've used it, I've used poblanas before. Um, I've actually found shishitos are really nice um, in this dish, dish as well. Um, it's very difficult to find the actual correct pepper to use here, but really any pepper, any pepper that's green and has that sort of grassy green flavor will do. Um, so we're just going to dice it up. You see, I took out the ribs and the seeds. Um, you can leave them in if you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, they, they, they'll, it'll have a little bit more heat. You know, if it's a spicy pepper you've got, leaving the ribs and seeds in will add a little bit more heat to the dish. So it all depends on how hot you want it, really. Okay, so we got our pepper diced. We go, uh, this little thing is called a sahan. It's um, a dish I picked up in, uh, in Istanbul. Um, it's what you would typically see this, di this uh, menemen made and served in. It's just uh, some extra virgin olive oil. This one is actually not that, I think I was using that Kirkland stuff before. This one is actually uh, from California. Um, I think it's Seca Hills, which is one of my favorite olive oils. It's an Arbor, this is an Arbequina. Seca Hills, that's S-E-K-A-H-I-L-L-S. I don't know how widely available it is outside of California, but I think it's available. I think it is. I think they might even sell it at Costco these days. I'm not positive though. So we're gonna let this kind of slowly soften up a little bit. Meanwhile, we're gonna um, get our tomato pulp. You can do this with canned tomatoes, um, but we're, we're gonna use some fresh tomatoes because uh, they looked decent at the supermarket the other day. Um, easiest way I know to get pulpy tomatoes is to cut them in half, hold your hand kind of flat against them like this, and then just grate them on the large holes of a box grater. And what happens is the flesh will go through but the skin won't. And the skin kind of acts as a, as a safety glove for you. So you end up with this, just the tomato skin. Under there, you get the pulp. I'm gonna do that with a couple of ripe tomatoes. You don't really have to go for those, you know, paste tomatoes, the tomatoes that you would normally use to make sauce for this. And it really works with any kind of tomato. This, by the way, this method is also how you would do uh, tomatoes if you were making Spanish um, tomato toast. Sorry, Catalonian tomato toast. Um, pan and tomaquette. Basically just, just toasted bread with olive oil and tomatoes. Also really good if you stick an anchovy on there, stick some uh, alioli on there. Alioli being the, you know, the Spanish form of, Catalonian form of um, aioli, the, garlic and olive oil, which if you're asking, and you're probably not, but I know some people are, my opinion is it still can be called aioli or alioli if it has an egg yolk in it. Um, they're just two different forms of the same dish. Um, very, very traditional version, old school version has uh, no egg yolk in it, just garlic and olive oil, salt and pepper. Actually, I have some I made last. I was, I was in the mood to make alioli last night, so I pulled out the mortar. That's what this mortar and pestle is doing here. Um, so I pulled it out and I made some alioli. So this is just garlic and olive oil. Um, you can see it forms a nice emulsion. Sorry, this is a big long aside. Forms an emulsion um, even without egg yolks. So you get this kind of nice, rich sauce. Oh, it broke a little bit in the fridge, so it's a little bit runny. Um, that's okay. Still taste. Still gonna taste good. Mmm, that is deliciously garlicky. 
All right. Peppers getting a teeny tiny bit brown, and that's sort of where I like to start, um, where I like to take them. And I add this tomato pulp in there. Grab my, uh, oh, you know, another thing people ask me is why I always use a dish towel when I grab pots and pans on the stove, even if they're cold. Um, and the answer is, you know, I think any cook, any anybody who's ever cooked professionally will at some point early in their career um, know the experience of grabbing a pan that had recently been in the oven um, and that is now sitting on the stove top, grabbing a pan by the handle without a, without a dish towel um, and melting off your fingerprints. Um, I did that a couple times early in my no, once. I did that once, um, very early in my career in a professional restaurant. I think that was also at um, uh, Number 9 Park, you know, my, my first sort of real restaurant job. Um, we were cooking, uh, I was cooking a chicken breast, an airline chicken breast for lunch service one day. Um, and that dish, you start by searing the, the breast skin side down in a skillet. Uh, and then you take the skillet. Um, and you transfer it, you flip the chicken over, you take the skillet and you transfer it to a uh, 450 degree oven. Um, and when the chicken breast is done cooking, you pull it out, put it back on top, and then you grab a bunch of sauce ingredients because you're gonna make this pan sauce in there. Um, and so I put the chicken back on top, I turned around, I grabbed some stuff, and then very stupidly, I just tss, grabbed the pan handle, my fingers kind of stuck to it, um, and I lost all my fingerprints. Um, and also, as any professional cook will tell you, um, the most painful kind of in injury you can get in a kitchen when you're working on the hotline is a burn because then every time you turn around and have to go towards that saute station or the flat top or whatever, um, you know, it's like 115, 120 degrees back there. And every time you get your hand near it, that burn just comes back and stings, stings, stings. And you can't, it's also the kind of injury that you can't really leave for, you know, like if you get a huge cut, you can, um, you know, you probably go to the emergency room um, and hope that you have workers comp. But um, with a burn, uh, you just got to keep cooking through it and it is extraordinarily painful. Anyhow, um, that's the kind of mistake you only make once. And so from then on, I, as every cook I know, um, got into the habit of using a towel anytime you touch anything. Anytime you grab a pan, you use a towel, no matter whether it's hot or cold, because uh, you never know. Oh, hang on a second. I think my daughter's waking up. I'll be back. Oh, sorry, uh, my daughter is awake now and is watching her Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, so that means I got about 22 minutes and 30 seconds before breakfast has to be on the table. But that's no problem because we're we're almost there. Um, Turkish breakfast, by the way, um, is usually a quite a large meal. Um, I'm not going to do the full thing, but I'm going to do some of the essential parts, what I consider the essential parts. Tomatoes, olives, uh, cucumber. Slice cucumber. <clears throat> and then the other thing, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things, uh, Turkish foods to eat, is um, it's called kaymak. It's a uh, buffalo milk uh, cheese, a fresh buffalo milk cheese that's sort of somewhere between, it's somewhere between like mozzarella and butter. So very, very uh, creamy and rich and soft. Um, and it's typically served as a slice with um, honey on it. And it is so, so incredibly delicious. Um, it's unfortunately one of those things that you simply can't get outside of Turkey, or at least certainly can't get in the United States. Um, the closest stuff that I can find is queso casero or queso fresco, um, a Mexican style white cheese. That's also what I'm gonna use in the, um, inside my uh, menemen. Oh, all right, so our tomatoes are cooking down. Let's season with a little bit of salt. Essentially, you want to cook this down, not until it's like a super rich paste, um, you know, like a, not like a super thick sauce, but you want to cook it down just so that raw tomato flavor is out of there um, and it kind of darkens in color just a little bit. But you still want it to be quite, um, quite saucy because we're going to pick this up with bread um, and sort of scoop it up as we eat. Oh, speaking of which, I had this uh, loaf of Turkish bread I made the other day. I'm just going to reheat it in the toaster oven. That bread... If you want to know the baker's percentages, um, 
It is well, 100% flour. I used uh, I used pizza flour, like a kind of high, high protein bread flour, um, double O pizza flour. So uh, like finely ground high protein bread flour. But what, honestly, any any kind of flour will work. Um, I used pizza flour and I used uh, about 50% water by weight to the flour and uh, another 15%. Um, I added kefir. But you don't have to do kefir. Um, I just used it because I had it. You could use uh, buttermilk, yogurt, um, milk. But you want about 15% dairy in there. And that's what, that kind of helps it stay soft and gives it a little more richness. Um, and then I did a no-knead method. So I let it, uh, I, I mix the ingredients and let it rise overnight. Oh, speaking of which, I have this other no-knead bread I've been working on. I'm doing another video. This is from last night. I started making this dough. I'm going to bake a loaf of bread later. <clears throat> I uh, let that bread rise overnight, form it into a ball, roll it out, put it in a uh, nine, I put it in a 12 inch pan, stretch it out, um, and then I, you brush the top. You well, you can dock it. You can. There's a little pattern you can make if you're doing like a Ramadan style Turkish bread where you poke your fingers all the way around the outside and then make a diamond pattern. Then you brush it with uh, egg wash, which is an egg mixed with water, beaten. Brush that on, and then I sprinkled it with. Um, black sesame seeds and kosher sea salt, uh, kosher salt, molten salt, crunchy salt. But uh, typically you would do sesame seeds and nigella seeds, but I don't have any nigella seeds on me right now, so I didn't. Let's get a few slices of this. I'm gonna put that right in here. Some decent honey. Right over the top. Honey and cheese, delicious. If you've had like, you know, Southern style biscuits with honey and butter, um, you know how good the combination of dairy and honey is together. Um, at my restaurant, we do honey butter with black pepper, crack, cracked black pepper for our, we serve it with our pretzels, um, which I think is also delicious. All right, here's our little spread. Bread's gonna, bread's gonna plop down there. Actually, let's do it on the bigger board so that I have room for the bread and the and the menemen. All right, let's go check on that menemen. Menemen, do 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 do. Menemen, do 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 do. Menemen, do 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 do. All right, could use a touch more olive oil. Um, Menemen is also very, very, um, you know, infinitely variable. Very, very, very variable. Uh, you can add um, a common addition would be sujuk, which is like a Turkish sausage, or um, bastirma, which is the uh, a beef cured beef um, that's well, it's the root of the word pastrami, bastirma. It's um, yeah, cured beef, cured raw beef. Uh, you can slice it up and add it in here. You could add some ground lamb. You could uh, add dried mint um, or fresh mint. Um, I'm actually going to take a little bit of the cheese and sprinkle it on the top at the end. All right, that bread is looking close to done, so now I'm going to start adding my eggs. I got here a couple different types of eggs. Um, so, by the way, people have asked me about uh, eggs, brown eggs versus white eggs. The only difference between a brown egg and a white egg is the, um, the uh, species, the breed of chicken that it comes from. Um, generally, brown chickens lay brown eggs and white chickens lay white eggs. Um, you know, there are exceptions. There's some chickens that lay green eggs. Um, uh, you know, some people also notice that some of my eggs are very, very dark yellow, um, like that one. These are ones that I get from the uh, Japanese market. And here's one, I think. Oh, there's another dark yellow one. Those are both from the Japanese market. And I know, I'm pretty sure one of these is just a standard organic egg from, Cal um, from Petaluma. There you go. That's a sort of standard supermarket egg. Um, the color comes from the feed of the hens. So if they eat things that are rich in carotenoid pigments, um, generally that means some kinds of insects, um, or more typically it'll be like flowers, uh, marigold, marigold leaves in particular. Um, the carotenoid pigments, give the eggs a orange color. Uh, it doesn't really have an effect on flavor um, in a completely blind setting. I've done, I've done, many, I've done multiple taste tests on this um, where we've taken various types of eggs um, and fed them to people blind. Um, 
in some cases I've done the test with, uh, you know, people fully blindfolded. Um, and other ones I did a test. If you read my book, there's a section at the beginning where I did a test uh, where I took eggs um, and I colored them green before scrambling them uh, and then had people taste them. Um, and the things when you take color out of the equation, um, almost all eggs taste the same. Uh, it's very difficult to tell one, one egg apart from another one. Um, but that said, we usually don't eat blindfolded and we certainly don't dye our eggs green before eating them typically. Um, so color actually is, you know, it does play an important, really important role in flavor um, because flavor is not just something we sense on our tongue um, or something we even, it's not even just something that we sense on our tongue or that we sense, you know, on our soft palate and our nose um, from the aroma. Um, Flavor is, um, is something that we synthesize in our brain. So it's, it takes a combination of all these, you know, all these different elements, um, what we sense in our tongue, what we sense in our eyes, the texture of food, uh, the mood we're in can have an effect on flavor. Um, and color certainly has an effect on, on, on flavor, on, uh, on what we taste. So, you know, when people say, oh, like all eggs are the same, Kenji proved it in this test. Like, well, that's only partially true. That's only true if you're literally eating uh, blindfolded. Um, if you're ever looking at your eggs while you're eating them, then color is gonna have an effect on their flavor. Um, and the darker the yolk, generally, the better eggs taste to people. Um, even, even if it's not really making a big difference on their actual tongue. All right, so now we added the eggs. I stirred them a little bit. Just, you don't wanna break them up too much. You know, this is not like a scrambled egg dish. You wanna leave kinda largish chunks of Largest se sections of white and yolk gives the dish some interesting uh, texture and flavor throughout. And then you want to kind of stop cooking, similar to a lot of these dishes, dishes you want to stop cooking uh, when the egg is still a little, little bit runny. You go a little bit longer than that um, because it'll continue cooking as you bring it to the table. And by the time it's done, <clears throat> by the time it runs down and ready to eat, uh, it will be perfectly set. Okay, this bread has been reheated. Um, bread, by the way, um, ooh, that's hot. The process of staling, um, when bread starts to get stiff, um, it's not just about dehydration. Um, what it actually is, is that the starch um, that has been gelatinized in fresh bread, um, as it cools down, it starts to recrystallize and forms a more rigid structure, and that's what makes stale bread firmer. Um, and that's the reason why uh, well, first of all, why bread can stale even if it's wrapped well and loses no moisture. Um, and it's also the reason why reheating um, will fix bread that has gone stale um, to a degree. You know. Reheating will re-gelatinize those starch, starch molecules. Oh, just another aside, if, you, uh, if you've ever tried reheating a tortilla um, or anything that's corn-based, um, corn, unlike wheat, uh, the starch in corn, it undergoes, it undergoes um, you know, retrogrades in the same way, but it's not as easily reversible. So a fresh corn tortilla, one of the reasons the, the, um, the tacos that you have in Mexico are so much better than the tacos you'll typically get here in the U.S. is because there you can get tortillas fresh virtually everywhere. Fresh meaning they have never been cooled down from the time they were made until the time they're served. Whereas in the U.S., um, most of the time you're going to find tortillas that have uh, been made at a factory, packaged, sent to the supermarket or sent to whatever, even the Latin market, um, and cooled down before serving. So then even when you reheat them because uh, corn starches are not as easily reversible after retrogradation, um, they're still going to be a little stale. Anyhow, I keep talking. Let's get our menu in. Let's finish it off with another little bowl, little drizzle of olive oil. Get out. Throw this on here. Oh, I had this feta out because if you don't have this um, queso fresco, this fresh sort of cottage cheese type thing, um, you can use feta. Or you can use no cheese at all. So, got a little cheese on top of there. I'm gonna go, add a, go ahead and add a little bit of chili as well.
<clears throat> All right, let's go into our spices. I'm gonna add a little bit of Urfa Bieber chili, which is, um, hmm, if I can find it, if I can find it. Oh, I think this is actually, that, that's it, mislabel. Urfa Bieber chili, um, this is labeled spicy sumac, I don't know why, but Urfa Bieber chili is a, is a type of dried chili from, um, from Turkey, and uh, it, um, it has a kind of smoky, spicy, sweet flavor. It's sort of like, it reminds me a little bit of ancho, but with a little bit of smokiness to it. Uh, it's, it's delicious. We use it in um, our, uh, we don't, actually we don't use it anymore. When we were doing a sort of um, a kebab with our impossible meat, um, our, our vegan meat at, at Worst Hall, um, we used to use uh, Urfa Bieber chili to flavor it. Now we do a different dish of meatballs. So. Anyhow, here we go. Um, this is Menemen. Menemen. Let me, let me take it over to the window so I can get you some good light again. <clears throat> Doesn't that look good? Wait a minute, let me, let me turn off a little piece of bread here. I had this in bre for breakfast in Turkey. I mean, we were there for a few years ago. We were in Istanbul for mm, Istanbul and a couple other places for about ten days, I think. And I think we had this twelve times. Mm. All right, I'm gonna let Alicia finish her Daniel Tiger. And then we're gonna have breakfast. And I will see you actually just in a little bit because uh, I'm going to be making that bread soon. All right. I'm sorry. Shabba, would you like a little bit of, would you like a little bit of bread? You have been waiting patiently. Here. Sit. Wait, 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 wait. A little bit too hot for you? All right, give it a rest first. All right, see you in a bit. 